to the U.S. and training, getting his surgical training in New York and then in Charleston, West Virginia, followed by fellowship in vascular surgery at the Arizona Heart Institute, a very famous place, and then returning to Charleston, West Virginia, where with hard work, commitment, and passion to vascular surgery, he went up the ranks to become professor of surgery, chief vascular endovascular surgery, director of the vascular residency and fellowship programs, medical director of the vascular lab, co-director of the vascular center of excellence. In addition, the contributions of Professor Ali Abu Rahma to the field of vascular surgery are way beyond counting. He has been an author and co-author of so many papers, more than 200 papers, with many of them on all aspects of vascular surgery, vascular, non-invasive vascular lab, carotid disease, endovascular procedures. He has been a co-editor of our Bible textbook, Rutherford. And most importantly, he has been the president-elect and currently the president of our most prestigious society, the Society for Vascular Surgery. So who better can we have to have our inaugural election? So with that and without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to our dear friend, Professor Ali Abu Rahman. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Habullah, and I'm really honored to be with you today to speak to colleagues and people who share the same mission of me being loyal to Arab American, particularly in this regard in vascular surgery. When I felt what presentation I need to present to you guys, I did not really think there's any better subject than giving you an update of the Society of Vascular Surgery Clinical Practice Guidelines of Extracranial Cerebrovascular Disease. That has been a special passion of mine and I felt that probably having these guidelines just published a few months ago might be a great idea to share with you. There's nothing to disclose except I must admit to you, these guidelines took us two years to put together and the Society of Vascular Surgery selected 10 prominent faculties from various members of the SPS who are interested in this field, and I was honored to be the chair of these guidelines. After working on this, these guidelines, we're able to get it online, I think, this past year, but then it became in print this coming this past January. So there's nothing to disclose except to admit without their help, I would not be able to put these guidelines together. When the writing committee met several times to determine the most important issues and questions of major interest to clinicians, with emphasis on level one evidence to be addressed in the clinical practice guidelines. We also seek Mayo Clinic Evidence Practice Center to help us in doing systemic review and meta-analysis, questions were selected for the guidelines specify using the most scientific method, which called PICO, framework, population, intervention, comparison, and outcome, and chosen based on the daily dilemma of facing the clinical surgeon and vascular surgery. One thing I need to remind you, the stroke prevention was considered the most critical outcome across all guidelines. When these people come to you to do carotid intervention, they're not coming to you to prevent the heart attack or prevent even death. They do not want to have a stroke. Therefore, the committee felt our major emphasis was should be on prevention of stroke. We pick these five questions. Unfortunately, as you know, by reading these five questions, it doesn't cover all topics or aspects of vascular disease. However, for any one of you who is familiar with 
United States clearing house for guidelines, which United States of America rely on accepting compensation for anything we do in medicine in United States. They no longer accept a textbook to be given to them. They want societies or organization to emphasize on few selected items, which might be controversial between all of us, but there is enough data in the scientific literature to give us a recommendation, whether level one, level two, level three. With that in mind, we were obliged to pick the most important three to five topics, which we felt there is enough data that we could go to, to tell us why we're getting this as a grade one or grade two or level evidence A or B. And two, we know these questions are extremely controversial, not only in the United States, but also worldwide. These are the questions you see. I'm not going to read them because we're going to go through one by one in the next several slides. However, there is other topics, as all of us know, covering lot of other things in management of exocrinal disease. As you notice here, risk factor modification, modern medical therapy, TCAR, which is now in the United States becoming very advanced, CA consideration, carotid imaging, carotid screening, post-intervention complication, et cetera, et cetera. What we did, we collected all these items, updated it, and put it in a separate document called Implementation Guidelines of the SVS. Let us start with the first important five question. Question number one is carotid endarterectomy recommended over maximum medical therapy in low surgical patients. Every question, we look to the evidence and the rationale. Then we come out with a recommendation. So what is the evidence so far? If you are looking to only randomized trial, there is only two randomized trial over the past 20 years. An American one, which called the ACAS, and primarily European one, led by mainly UK. The ACST, the asymptomatic carotid surgery trial. Both of them favor CA, which I'm sure all of you know. However, just to remind any of the junior members who might not be familiar with the numbers, the American one, the asymptomatic carotid atherosclerosis study, looked to roughly 1,662 patients. It showed superiority of CA with medical therapy over only medical therapy. The number was 5% versus 11%. In other words, a reduction of a stroke by 55%. The recommendation recommended CA who are below the ease of 80, as long as expected combined stroke and death by the operator of no more than 3%. How about the European, the European one, the ACST? The number of patients enrolled in this study even was twice as much, 3,120. The finding almost equivalent to the finding of the American study. What I think unique about the European one, they even went to beyond the five years. They went all the way to 10 years. It still, it was impressive, significant reduction of stroke. It's 13% versus 18%. Someone might question these two trials which is understandable. That's why we put that question in these guidelines. And what are these questions or limitations? The strength of the conclusion question based on modest absolute reduction plus the contention that medical arm did not reflect contemporary medical therapy. Many of them were not on statin therapy, for example. So what we relied on an article published just less than a year ago where they look to stroke rate of patient receiving lipid lowering medications. Again, as part of the ACST trial, analyze these patients and the finding as noted in the bottom of the slide. There was still a conclusion of 
carotid endarterectomy is still superior than medical therapy. The reduction was not as much, but still was significant. As you see in this number, 0.7% versus 1.3% per year, which was significant p-value for those who were on lipid-lowering therapy. For those who were not on lipid-lowering therapy, the stroke rate was 1.8 versus 3.3 per year for those not on, uh, um, on lipid-lowering therapy. Another question came to be, some of the studies of these randomized trials look to 60% and above. So we felt perhaps we need to be a little bit adding this and make it maybe to 80% or 90%. So we felt, let's look into a study which was very impressive, published just several months ago, correlating a stroke to severity of carotid instance, carotid stenosis. And here, it was from Oxford Vascular Study, and I'm going to share with you the data. It showed ipsilateral stroke at five years in patients who have 70 to 99% stenosis was 14.6% versus little, literally is zero for people below 70%. The reason I'm telling you this, because you're probably reading several medical articles, a neurology article, primarily from Australia, indicating by medical therapy is as good as intervention. Unfortunately, most of these study by Professor Abbott from, from Australia really include all patients with asymptomatic disease, including above 50%. But that's not exactly what we're doing. We're looking to anything above 70%, and the findings were impressive on this impressive Oxford Vascular Study Group. When it get to be 80 to 99, that's even much, much more impressive difference. 18% versus 1%. When they look to 56 report of covering over 13,717 in a 23 studies, look at the conclusion also. For patient above 70 to 99, increased risk of ipsilateral stroke than 50 to 70%, and the odd ratio was 2.1. And actually, they felt at that time, the conclusion of benefit of CA perhaps is underestimated in patients with severe stenosis de de defined by anything above 70%. The five-year stroke decreased in patients below 70 in contemporary medical therapy. With all this review with you, the SVS guidelines came out with the following recommendation. In low surgical risk patient with asymptomatic carotid stenosis above 70%, we recommend CA with best medical therapy over maximum medical therapy alone for long-term prevention of stroke and death. And we gave it grade 1B, and that, as I told you, published in January 2022. We also felt it might be worthwhile to complete this subject to look to some type of patient who all of us know they have tendency to be higher risk of a stroke. The reason we did that for people who are still hesitant to offer intervention across the board for everybody above 70, we felt if you have any of these risk factors, which there are enough data to prove they were associated with higher stroke risk. Perhaps if you have any of these data that really push you further to do the intervention, and these are the risk factors. Increased risk of ipsilateral stroke was noted in the following. Stenosis progression, silent infarct or CT, plaque ecolucency, intraplaque hemorrhage, large plaque area, spontaneous embolization on TCD. There were recommendations with that in mind. We felt these type of patients, you should not hesitate in ordering carotid intervention with the same criteria. They have to have decent life expectancy and the carotid intervention should not have a risk equal or above, should be below 3%. And then 
we filled the modality of intervention with a CAA, a T-car, or transfemoral carotid stenting depends on the following three tabulation. One of them is what you see here. These are high risk for CAA, which all of you know, looking to the right side, neck radiation. I'm not trying to you don't do it. I have done many of these, but now they are probably safer and better way of doing it. Neck radiation, previous CAA, previous neck surgery, tracheal stoma, high lesion above C2, contralateral vocal cord injury, hostile neck because of obesity or immobility or medical high risk. High risk for TCAR, almost similar to high risk for CAA or high risk for transfemoral carotid stenting. As noticed here, age above 75, heavily calcified lesion, complex bifurcation and the lesion longer than 50 millimeter, tortuous carotid artery, type three aortic arch, or heavy atherosclerotic building of the aortic arch. Recommendation, we are hoping also several upcoming randomized trial to answer the role of modern medical therapy in management of asymptomatic carotid stenosis and that should be coming in space two, a German trial, or the American trial, which really no longer American because there is some European center participating, is CRESS two. I cannot speak on behalf of space two, but I could speak on behalf of CRESS two. Within a year or two, we ought to have some meaningful data from CRESS two. Now, because we did not elaborate on this on the clinical practice guidelines summary. We put it on the implementation document, which I'm encouraging you if your time allow, perhaps to refer to it. And it's also published in January, 2022. I think that's the most important question we felt we need to address. Question two, is carotid endartrectomy recommended over transfemoral carotid stenting? and low standard risk for CAA for about 50%. Why did we take that question? Because many of non-vascular colleagues still argue transfemoral stenting is as good as surgery. Why? They rely on the CRIS data, which combined stroke, death, and MI together. However, we looked at it differently. And I'm going to share with you the evidence. We looked into the most important coated randomized trial, which you see here, CREST, EVA3S, which is the French, SPACE1, which is the German, ICSC, the international, which is originally UK. The systemic analysis by Mayo Clinic gave us this figure. You don't need to be genius looking to the bars on the left side, it favors CA. In the right side, it favor CAS. So the 30-day outcome is clearly for prevention of stroke and death go in favor of CA. And look at the bottom, the overall odd ratio is 0.68 reduction of stroke and death because of preoperative 30 days. When you look even at five years risk of any stroke, Look at the left side in the meta-analysis, the bottom one over line over 0.79 favoring CA over cast stenting. With that in mind, it did not take us very much for the recommendation. Recommended CA over transfemoral cast stenting in standard surgical risk patient. And look how strongly we felt. It's grade one, level A. That's the highest recommendation anybody can get. We went to question number three. What is the optimal timing of carotid intervention in patient presenting with acute stroke? Immediately, day number one, day number two, first week, second week, and what was the evidence and rationale? Unfortunately, there was not much randomized trial addressing this issue. So we got the closest to the strongest evidence. And what we have seen, work by Naylor, who's everybody know, 
the most respected authority in UK, but it was single center series. It showed 30 day stroke and death rate of 2.4% in patients who had TA, uh, CA within 48 hours of symptoms. In other words, it's suggesting to be done first day or second day. However, when we look to very large register data, whether Germany, Sweden, USA, multi-center, single center, all of them show if CA performed in the first week, not the first 48 hours, the result was as good as the UK single centers series. So we just felt uncomfortable recommending CA in the first 48 hours. So our recommendation is seen here. In patients with recent stable stroke, it has to be modified rank in a score below three. You don't want to go beyond zero or one or a two. We recommend carotid revascularization for symptomatic patient above 50. As soon as the patient become neurologically stable and generally within day number three up to day number 14, and we felt because we could not find level one evidence, we felt maybe this is grade one, level B. In patient undergoing that revascularization in the first 14 days, not the first 48 hours, there was enough data to let us shift for CA, not carotid stenting, and that also was grade one B evidence. Question number four. That's extremely controversial in America. I don't know about Europe or the Middle East or anywhere else. Is screening for asymptomatic carotid stenosis recommended in the general population? What is the evidence? Screening found to decrease risk of stroke in cost-effective manner if the prevalence of above 50%, which means significant carotid stenosis, is equal or above 20%. Now, if it is above, there is enough data to show it was worth doing carotid intervention. With prevalence of less than 5% in the general population, coming from a lot of studies, we just felt screening does not appear to decrease stroke risk. Even it might be harmful because you might be doing unnecessary intervention. The position actually not only supported by us, but also by the National Stroke Association, the Canadian Stroke Consortium, and more important than that, United States Preventive Task Force. With that in mind, the SPS recommended against routine screening for clinically asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis in patients without cerebrovascular symptoms or no significant risk factor for carotid artery disease and that was grade one A. However, there are scenarios where screening might be justified. What does this mean? There must be some high risk asymptomatic patients who might be more likely to be associated with significant carotid stenosis. Looking to this figure, you do need to be genius looking to the middle one shaded in orange. I hope you see that colored middle stack. Starting with PAD, look into PAD, the presence of above 15% is almost 18%. PAD and combined with coronary artery disease, 18%. PAD with the smoking, 22%. Smoking alone, 28%. And the more you go down, the more associated risk factors, the more likely up to look at the bottom one, diabetes, coronary artery disease and renal failure, almost half of them. And with that in mind, we felt perhaps a screening is justified for the following. Patient with lower extremity PAD, patient undergoing cabbage, patient above the age of 55 with two traditional atherosclerotic risk factors, patient above 55 and active cigarette smoking, Patient with diabetes, hypertension, with or without coronary artery disease, and patient, of course, with cerebral infarct, incidentally, on MR or CT scan. 
the presence presence of additional carotid brewery is more or less is an extra factor to encourage you for screening. Question number five, which is the last question for the major document. What is the optimal sequence for intervention in patient combined carotid and coronary intervention? In patient with symptomatic carotid stenosis, it doesn't take a genius to say patient have a TIA or stroke and they need a cabbage. So most of us in by you have to do either combined or CAA before or concomitant with cabbage to decrease the risk of stroke. However, we did not feel there's enough level one data to give us greater recommendation. So we gave this a grade two level C and we left it based on the clinical presentation and institutional experience. The reason I'm telling you this, there's some institution have a 10 and 15% risk of stroke and death when they combine. There's some institution which publish data, they have a stroke and death of less than 5%. So you need to look to your own institution and your own expertise and decide a carotid first, followed by cabbage or combine them together. How about the asymptomatic patients? We give an exception to people who have bilateral severe disease defined by above 70 to 99% or 70% on one side and contralateral occlusion. And we suggested here CAA before or concomitant with cabbage. What is our recommendation? In patient requiring carotid intervention, staged or synchronous with coronary intervention, the decision to be made according to what we just suggested, your institutional experience, the timing of the procedure, the need for anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy and patient anatomy characteristic. The Society of Vascular Surgery, as indicated to you, ended by going in depth about many other aspects of management of extracranial cerebrovascular disease. And that's been referred to the implementation guidelines. There's no way on earth I could spend the probably day or two covering the, the topics here. But I first let me pick some few, few topics of this in the next 10, 15 slides. But just to remind you and all the audience, this implementation guidelines cover introduction means how often we see stroke, not only in America, but worldwide, cause of stroke, carotid imaging indication, optimal medical therapy is impressive, almost 15, 20 pages about optimal medical therapy with all risk factor modifications, carotid intervention indication, it branches in everything else, including TCAR, CA technical consideration, whether closure, anesthesia, incisions, everything you want to, timing of carotid intervention in stroke, carotid stenting, external carotid endotrectomy techniques, complication of carotid interventions, including CA and CAS, any miscellaneous topic, including cognitive function after intervention, treatment of proximal vertebral artery disease, treatment of brachiocephalic disease and proximal common carotid artery occlusion disease. Therapy of con concomitant cor uh, coronary and carotid disease. Therapy of carotid disease and major non-cardiac surgery. Operative volume and specialty for carotid intervention. Post-carotid intervention surveillance. Carotid intervention, CA or CAS and cognitive function. And finally, even cost analysis of CA versus CAS. I picked for you the following because I felt it might address some controversies. And I'm going to summarize for you some of these recommendations. What do we do with the carotid imaging indication whether symptomatic or asymptomatic? I'm sure all of you agree on this. Duplex ultrasound performed in accredited laboratory is the initial diagnostic imaging of choice for evaluating severity of carotid stenosis. Since we're talking to the pan Arab Medical Vascular Society, you might not have accredited body in your institution. So what I'm recommending, a lab that you know well, 
you know how this lab is doing, you know the quality of testing, so that's what you need to rely on in your own country. Unequivocal identification of carotid stenosis, 50 to 99 is symptomatic, 70 to 99 and asymptomatic is sufficient enough to make decision making regarding intervention. And let me share with you, in my practice of over 40 years of carotid intervention, at one day I was used to do two to 300 a year. Nowadays, being aging and senior, it's down to 50 or even less. What I'm trying to tell you, 90% of my intervention rely on vascular laboratory without any further imaging. And why I say further imaging? I don't know about Arab countries or Middle East, a CTA in my institution is 1,500 American dollars. An MRA of the arch and carotid is 4,000 American dollars. Carotid duplex ultrasound is only three to $400. This is the cost in America. Therefore, I do not justify a carotid duplex on everybody. There are some patient need, some people don't. And that's a rationale of my imaging modality, which shared by many American authorities here in the United States. Now, if duplex ultrasound result is equivocal or maybe inaccurate, then other imaging ought to be done. Whether CTA, MRA, that's left to you, but keep in mind, I don't know about your own institution and your own country, keep in mind in terms of cost. When evaluating vessels proximal or distal to cervical carotid, then everybody know you have no choice except to add another imaging, whether CTA, MRA, or DSA is up to you. But definitely, CEA is preferred over MRA for extreme calcification. Next item is CA and choice of anesthesia. I don't want to share you with you all these randomized trials. My first really and most important trial is, since my colleague, Professor Jamal Habullah was in Rome, is an Italian professor, Dr. Cal, is probably the most important trial in the English literature when it comes to anesthesia, the GALA trial. The GALA trial clearly showed the stroke and death, stroke and death and MI equivalent between do it local or do it general. So therefore, the choice of anesthesia between regional, local, or whatever you want to, is equivalent and it depends on your own institution. Some anesthesiologists don't feel comfortable with the local. Even the vascular surgeon might not be. Therefore, both techniques have similar outcome, both, both based on availability and expertise of effective block. How about the closure? I hate to bug you with this. I have close to eight randomized trial looking to type of closure of CA. And quite many of the Cochrane data really rely on Dr. Abu Rama's publications. And it clearly shows level one evidence that support recommendation in favor of routine patching if you want to be close-minded. However, the writing group also feel a larger ICA, preferably above six millimeter, you probably could be comfortable doing primary closure. No difference between preferential use of various patches. Dacron, PTFE, pericardial patch, it does not make a difference. They are equivalent. No difference in a stroke rate between conventional CA with patching and aversion. If you are familiar with aversion and the patient is good selection for aversion, the data are equivalent between patching and aversion. The rate of significant post ca stenosis between CA with patching and aversion is equivalent, but both were superior to primary closure. Let's shift gear into CAS, carotid artery stenting. One of the options is access. Proper imaging of aortic arch and carotid bifurcation has to be done, which all of us probably know before you do anything. If you have younger patients 
an aortic arch free of obvious disease, there is no doubt transfemoral is probably the axis of choice. Why? It's an easy, it's percutaneous, you don't need to do any cutting. Transradial and transbrachial, if you still want to do something percutaneously, is especially beneficial in patient with bovine arch or even patient with carotid subclavian bypass. Transcarotid, which is DT car, is actually in the last few years in our practice and in United States has the advantage of avoiding disease, tortuous aortic arch, providing CA lock protection. How about if you do carotid stenting? what type of cerebral protection devices you need to use. Most authorities and trials showed almost equal data between whether distal or proximal devices in terms of protections. There's no evidence showing any difference. However, there's no doubt the bottom slide, bottom line of this slide, a T car with the reversal of the flow showed the lowest reported stroke rate of any data of carotid stenting. So perhaps it does have the advantage over any type of other protection devices. Stroke and acute cast complications. Stroke secondary to MCA occlusion owing to embolization after cast should be treated if you have that ability in your institution with mechanical thrombectomy and thrombolysis. Acute carotid stent occlusion should you also be treated with the same, including eventually after you remove the thrombus aspiration, a filter removal. Acute carotid stent complications also need to remind you with aggressive post-PTA should be avoided when possible, unless you have a more than 30% residual stenosis. Pre-PTA after you put the device is probably okay, but post-PTA generally is not recommended unless you have to. Management of free stenosis after CA. As we indicated, the use of a patch angioplasty or reversion will minimize this to start with. Early recurrent stenosis after CA in the first year or two are generally recommended to be treated with medical therapy unless they are really, really very, very high grade. I personally believe over 90% and they are progressive because the natural history has been relatively benign. Recurrent stent, uh, stenosis after CA should be considered for reintervention if this happened a few years later because you are dealing with back to almost atherosclerotic lesion. It treated generally as primary CA, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, if you believe in treating asymptomatic patients. Reintervention for recurrent stenosis after CA can be done either redo or carotid reconstruction or preferably nowadays with carotid stenting. Treatment of free stenosis after CAS. That's something I like you to remember because there are somewhat totally different than treating after carotid artery in the artrectomy. Most asymptomatic, above 70%, asymptomatic after carotid stenting, the majority, some people will claim over 95%, do not cause symptoms of ipsilateral tear or stroke, because of which we feel would probably or to not to be treating these with aggressive therapy and should be treated medically. Symptomatic patient and progressive lesion perhaps should be offered in the vascular option first. Evidence with a PTA, if you have recurrent stenting after stent, recurrent stenosis, drug coated balloon or re-stenting is lacking. Recommendation after acute IC occlusion similar to what we discussed after carotid stenting. Intravenous thrombolysis should be administered as first line of therapy in patients with early acute ICA occlusion. I prefer to be done if it's within six hours. Some people now try it even 24 hours, but most of the literature recommended to be done within six hours. 
endovascular treatment may be considered and has acceptable optimal outcome. Treatment of brachiocephalic and proximal common carotid artery disease. Intervention, open or endovascular treatment, treating proximal common carotid artery, like a nominate, are generally not suggested if they are asymptomatic. Most of the data feel these are have more benign natural course history. In symptomatic patient, however, they ought to be treated whether by open or endo or hybrid, whether cervical extra anatomical bypass or transthoracic. It depends on the ex expertise, patient anatomy, and other comorbidities. Embolic protection device is suggested if you are treating for endovascular intervention. And the final couple of slides are summarized here. Therapy for carotid disease and other major non-cardiac surgery. Any surgery you want to other than cardiac, the one we discussed originally in the main clinical practice guidelines. Before non-cardiac surgery, preoperative cardiac and carotid imaging is suggested in patients who had past history or stroke in the past three to six months. That's acceptable by anybody. Patient with coronary artery disease undergoing non-cardiac, I'm sorry, carotid uh, artery disease undergoing non-cardiac surgery should have the same indication for intervention as general population. In other words, if you're doing colon resection and incidentally, there is significant carotid stenosis. If it's asymptomatic, you proceed with the primary pathology you have to start with. There's no urgency for this. If you have a patient with a crudication, there is no urgency for this. However, if you have acute limb ischemia, that will take a priority over your carotid. And I'm saying if it is asymptomatic carotid disease, if possible, the statin and on top later therapy should be continued perioperatively. And a patient has asymptomatic carotid stenosis and a critical limb ischemia, they should be addressed first which means the critical limb ischemia should be addressed first. How about carotid intervention surveillance? That's extremely lengthy topic, but I want to give you the recommendation. After C or CAS, surveillance with duplex ultrasound, everybody know you got it either post-op, but preferably before the first three months, so you have a baseline. And you will be there after until stable, in other words, until no restenosis observed in two consecutive annual scan. Subsequent interval or regular surveillance every two years based on contralateral stenosis or the risk profile and life expectancy. And as Dr. Hasbullah told you earlier, I'm leaving you with this slide. It's my home in West Virginia, and I would love to see you one day. Visit the Greenbrier in Sulphur Spring in West Virginia. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm honored to give this talk, and I'm be glad to answer any question from any one of you. Thank you very much, Professor Jamal. I don't hear him. Uh... Mm. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Abu Rahma, for a very elegant and comprehensive presentation on the topic of carotid disease. You really covered uh, almost everything we would like to hear about. And uh, first, I would like to tell the participants that uh, they are welcomed again, and we are very interested in hearing their questions. So please send us your questions on the chat or in the Q&A. Some of you have already sent questions on the Q&A. Our preferable one is on the chat. I summarized some of the questions to Dr. Abu Rahma. The first question has to do with the diagnosis of carotid disease. What are the preferable duplex criteria that you are using for 70% stenosis? Uh, how are you applying the NASET criteria uh, in the evaluation of the degree of stenosis? And finally, all related to diagnosis, 
when you have someone uh, where when you are going to do carotid endarterectomy based on carotid duplex alone, uh, do you have any concerns about tandem lesions higher up in the intracranial or more proximal lesion, lesions in the arch and for which you may want to decide on getting a CTA on these patients? So please, Dr. Abrahma, we appreciate your, your answer to these questions first. Let me just make sure, Professor uh, Jamal, you hear me. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Let me, let's start with the diagnostic imaging carotid and why only duplex ultrasound is Let's start with the criteria. I would love to refer you to several articles published at the JVS from Dr. Abarama's institution. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to some of the textbook I published in the past, it summarizes it very, very well. I have a modification criteria from the consensus criteria where if you have a peak systolic velocity above 230 centimeter per second associated with at least above 50% carotid placking, at least above 50%. That was have a close to 90% plus accuracy in detecting equal or above 70%. But again, you have to see above 230 and you must have a placking of above 50%. To make you feel better, if the endostolic or the peak systolic ratio is above four or endostolic is above 100, you even feel better and better in terms of relying on duplex ultrasound. Now, should you get another imaging like a CTA? In countries outside the United States, I would encourage it because I, was, I got a little bit sick two, three years ago in Amman. And I went to modern hospital and I got a CT of my abdomen and chest. And it shocked the hell of me when I paid the bill in cash. And it was 120 Jordanian dinar. That's close to 150 or 160 American dollars. That was, of course, two, three years ago. If you're going to pay that amount, I don't think it's a bad idea not to do CTA in your institution. It will give you better anatomy. It will give you anything you want to, as Professor Haboa just suggested. However, if you want to rely on duplex ultrasound in your own lab, Happy and I opened this lab 44 years ago. I'm afraid some of you maybe were not born then. And after doing over a million imaging, I could tell you whether this study is really decent or not. If you have a proximal disease, there's no doubt in our mind you will have unbelievably impressive, a blunted, common carotid signal. That's the type of patient you don't operate, only doing duplex ultrasound. If you have a distal disease intracranially, you will have also impact on the signal you get. So you have to be extremely selective. And that's, what, that's why I said the lab has to be a really great quality lab. But I don't want you to leave this and say I should not be getting CTA or MR. I need to remind you also, this is for asymptomatic carotid disease, not for symptomatic. Every symptomatic ought to give not only CTA, but also intracranial imaging. That's recommended in our guidelines for every symptomatic carotid disease. You must combine it with other imaging. So to answer your question, you have to be selective when you pick these. And I would refer you as I indicated earlier. Now, there are some criteria which we published 20, 30 years ago, different than what I just told you, which we started doing in the last 10 years. They were also somewhat accurate, but we modified lately, and it's almost accepted by most authorities in the United States, the modification of the consensus criteria. I hope that answered the questions they raised, uh, Professor Habola. Thank you very much. How about the using the NASET criteria about how to measure the degree of stenosis? Th that's, that's a good point. Looking back to our criteria, read the article. It will tell you these were based on the NASET criteria. What does this mean? The duplex validation velocities were based on how the NASET did the estimation of disease. And for the people who might not be familiar with this, there are three methods of measuring the stenosis. 
but we rely on the NACID. There is the ECST criteria. What you do, you go to the artery distally where the wall become parallel and you look to the artery which is narrowed where the plaque is, measure the lumen where the plaque is, complete that diameter, compare it to the artery when it become parallel and see what velocities you get. So this is how we validated our criteria. That's an excellent point, uh, Professor Jamal. Okay, well, thank you very much. I would like to ask my colleagues, my panelists here, uh, for their contribution to the questions. Uh, who would like to start first? Uh, Dr. Nazal, could you uh, give us some comments and questions, please? Could you unmute Dr. Nazal? Because I think he's muted and he's not able to talk the same as happened to me earlier. Dr. Shev, okay. Here. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I was on. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Brahma. That was a great summary and lecture. I have a question related to carotid stenosis patient, which I have a patient now, I might do. Uh, but the patient has intracranial bleed and a stroke as well as stenosis more than 60% from the same area of the carotid disease. What is the best intervention? How did they, how did they have intracranial bleed? Is it just incidental? The, he had intracranial bleed two, uh, 10 days ago, possible from hypertension, but then he got a stroke two, day, uh, two days ago. And how do you know the stroke is not related to the bleed and not the 60% stenosis? So we don't know that. that. Uh, he did not have the uh, the stroke two weeks ago. I got you. So you are questioning it might be still related to the 60%. Yeah. Is that uh, correct? Yeah. By how, how, how large, the professor, how large the bleed and how large the infarct? So the infarct is small and the bleed is still small. Uh, the question, should I do nothing, stinting, and then I need aspirin plavix or surgery? If you combine, I understand that. If you combine a bleed with a stroke, that's, as you know, a very rare rarity, and the stenosis is not really very tight, I'll be leaning more a medical therapy at this stage and make sure they are stabilized, and I would do it probably in two, three weeks, definitely less than a month or so. Part of the stenosis is just 60%. Then the question, how do I treat it medically? You have no choice except probably Maybe one on top later therapy, but I promise you, there is no single study to answer this question. And you know what's sad? We didn't even have that scenario covered in our carotid guidelines. <laughs> Absolutely. There are need to find out the solution. <laughs> unless, unless the patient had a crescendo TIA and the stroke is good, I would really like you, if you love me, to hold a little bit from today. And if it was only within the past 14 days, because I'm worried about the hemorrhage will be exaggerated plus that. Yes. Let me okay. tell you something, Professor um, Nazal. In my first 20 years of practice, when we're learning more and more about how to treat some of these, I was used to treat TI patient or stroke months later. And most of the time, we're getting to be safe. But nowadays, we have more data to let us know. If we're lucky, it doesn't mean it's the right thing. But to have someone combination of bleed, and a stroke in the lesion, which is only in the 60% range, give me a little bit chills, should I operate at all? Yes. And definitely not a carotid stenting. Not carotid stenting. So yes, the, next, the question, you kept talking about T-car and transfemoral in the, uh, stenting as yes. if they are equivalent. But the, many people doubt that. They are not equivalent. You mean the T-car and transfemoral? Yes, the stenting. No, which means there must be misunderstanding or maybe my Arab-American accent did not do that job. This is injustice. I hope not everybody understood that. There is no way the T-car, based on the data we have, not only in roster one and roster two, actually we have a study supposed to be in press right now showing the T-car stroke rate and stroke and death is half of the transfemoral carotid stenting. So the answer, no, they are not equivalent, period. Yes. Thank I'm you. glad you wrote that point. So my colleagues will have this clarification. 
Any questions from the panelists? I have a few questions still for Dr. Abu Rahma, but I would like to have my uh, uh, colleagues and co-founders of the PAVIS uh, contribute to the questions. Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, so, Dr. Ali, thank you very much. That is a great comprehensive review. Uh, as always, you're the man for greater disease. Um, my question is, in some parts of the world, and definitely in the Middle East, patient choice tends to be skewed towards what they perceive as the minimalist intervention, which is a stenting. Should your patient request that, what's your best advice of how um, you know to put it to them that we still, in the era of that carotid endarterectomy or TCAR recently, is 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 the better choice? Is patient choice a factor at all? I that, that's an excellent point. There's no doubt in my mind a good patient, if they have a trust in their surgeon, let us say yourself, if you share with them the data, not only from United States worldwide, and show them the difference between both, particularly when it comes to stroke prevention, I don't know how they'll be crazy in their mind to dictate on you as interventionalist what to be done. However, if they're still adamant of doing stenting, Perhaps these are the type of patient I would offer them a T-car because there is enough data to indicate T-car is almost as equal as carotid endarterectomy. And all what you are doing, as you know, is one inch cut above the collarbone. However, as you know, if they see a cardiology colleague, which I don't know any one of them is listening or not, which you hope they are because part of my group is interventional cardiology in my own team and they share my views. If they were a cardiologist, unfortunately, I could see some Jordanian or Egyptians or Moroccan, they trust their doctor and they just go for it. But that's really injustice because we are looking to stroke and death. I really believe, um, Mamoun, they probably would eventually listen to you. And if they don't, I personally feel strong enough today or old enough to say, go and find someone else to do your procedure. So it's not likely. I got this in the United States in West Virginia. The people look to the internet and social media and they come and show you a picture that said, this is what I want. Most of them shift around when you tell them the why is not stenting, particularly for symptomatic lesion. Now for asymptomatic Professor, is that different scenario? There is a couple of carotid trial showed for asymptomatic lesion, the stroke rate might be equivalent, but not in every registry, like the SVS VQI registry. It's coming from a specific center, specific expertise, who does carotid stenting all the time. But as you know, United States doesn't buy that. They want to see what the data across the continent of United States. The data is two, three times more stroke rate with carotid stenting than in the So therefore, that's the reason in United States, carotid stenting percutaneously is not, is not compensated and reimbursed for, for asymptomatic lesion. Just to keep you up to date, just two weeks ago, the Medicare gave instruction to CMS, which is the one who compensate or pay for reimbursement, after the FDA approved the transcarotid stinting for carotid disease, symptomatic or asymptomatic, and the CMS now chewing it to decide whether to pay for it or not, and the SVS working with them to tell them, yes, pay for it if it's part of SVS VQI initiative. In other words, they want to collect data for roughly five years, and the only way of collecting it is through registry, which is respected by everybody in the United States, including us, the American College of Cardiology, who now participate in the SVS VQI data. If these people, after five years, we found TCAR is equivalent to CA, then every other insurance will pay for it. So 
I think that's a strong data for you to share with your patient. And I hope that will convince them differently. Thank you very much. Professor Musa, do you have a question for uh, May, for may I interrupt you, Professor Jamal? I, I, need, I, need, I need to add a little comedian uh, because the Egyptian is the one taught me. Did you tell them after my hour, every question we charge $100 per, per question? <laughs> They don't know we, that. We, we will pay. We will pay more for okay. your wisdom, Professor Abrahma. We'll pay yeah. more. Pl more. Pleasure more. to be with you. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Professor Masad, do you have a question? Maybe he's not connected. I don't or know. Or he doesn't. Or he doesn't have hundred dollar. <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure that Professor Omar al farooq he has a hundred dollars with him. So, <laughs> Professor Omar, ask the questions until we hear back from Professor Musad, and then I will. I have some other questions from the chat group that I would like to present uh, to uh, Professor Abu Rahma. Uh, and we promise not to keep you very long, Professor Abu Rahma. Yes. And we promise the audience that if there are any questions that we could not get to answer by directly here, we will answer them through Dr. Abu Rahma. And then put them on our uh, on our uh, post. Uh, that, that's fine. That's fine. Professor Omar, Fadl, unmute him, please, because he's still muted. While we're waiting for Dr. Omar, uh, Dr. Ali, you had a special discount on the imaging in Amman three years ago. It's kind of a lot more expensive these days, my friend. <laughs> that, that's interesting. That's interesting. As I told you, I was really shocked. And incidentally, when I brought that CTA with me to make sure some of my experts here do nothing, I was worried about pancreatic cancer because mom died from pancreatic cancer. They were so impressed with the color. They said, where well, these were done. And I told them in Jordan, I said, oh my God, that as good or better than what we have here. And when I told them I paid 120 Jordanian dinar, they were shocked. I'm just trying to tell you. <laughs> It seems that uh, Professor Omar al farooq is not able to connect and, uh, and uh, ask questions. Maybe we'll ask, maybe uh, Professor Musad, are you able to uh, ask any questions you have, we have you now with us? Are you muted or are you able to talk? We probably can take some of the questions in the uh, chat. Uh, so let me ask the questions from the chat. One of the important questions from the chat is what is your currently Preferable method for intraoperative monitoring when you are doing carotid endarterectomy, e.g., monitoring uh, routine shunting, uh, I, regional I, anesthesia. I understand that. I actually had a couple of also published articles, including one of them is randomized trial, and one of them is for the JVS. It was a review, systemic article review. And let me remind all the audience. There was no difference between one monitoring method and the other. How about my practice? For the first 20, 30 years, I tried almost every monitoring method and I quit. Why? My own feeling, if you're doing the surgery right and you have a specific methodology you follow for 20, 30, 40 years, 98 to 99% of the time, you ought not to need any imaging. But if you are questioning whether a technical ability or something, I think duplex ultrasound is the one we rely in doing intraoperative or completion imaging. That's what I do personally. But if you are not sure what you need to do in your institution, I think duplex imaging, if you have, is absolutely more than enough. We talk about, I presume, completion imaging. Now, intraoperative, intraoperatively, I think if you're doing it under general anesthesia, if you have ability of EEG, is it probably more sensitive? And that's what I would recommend. But I do not do any intraoperative monitoring either. Why? Because I personally shunt everybody. I do not select shunt. But if you want to select shunt, I would say probably the EEG is the best way of doing it. Great. Um, another question has to do with the uh, credentialing and uh, training for doing TCAR. Is there any new recommendation? And if the individual does not have within his institution the ability to do a salvage procedure for stenting, 
for example, someone has a acute uh, embolus to the MCA. Uh, is that a requirement that you need to have it within your institution so that you'll be able to deal with your complications or not do it at all? Or what do you that, That's an excellent point. I think to be fair to all of you, I refer you to SPS guideline in regard to this issue also. It was published just six months ago by a colleague of mine by the name of Keith Caligaro, Keith Caligaro from Philadelphia, and him and another seven members of the SVS published credentialing for TCAR. As you know, and I, Jamano and Nazal, I don't think you could apply these into in the country of Jordan or Egypt or Morocco, because I don't know what your politics there. However, in my own rationale in my head, if you don't do percutaneous transfemoral stenting, and you're talking to a guy who started doing transfemoral stenting in 1993. I have done them for almost 27 years. So if you never done transfemoral carotid stenting, I think it's much easier to do TCAR, but I'm wondering whether Silk Road has to be able to have representative in your own country to give you tutoring for like they do it for all surgeons. They come to the SPS headquarters in Chicago and they spend one day course because they don't need to teach them how to cut about the clavicle. They just want to make sure once you do the arteriotomy, how do you push the wire, how, how, for a surgeon who have done carotid artrectomy, one day course, and usually then they like to supervise you for two, three cases. But I don't know which country in the Middle East have a representative from Silk. Would Silk Road allow you to have the system to be shipped in your country? So it is doable, and I really believe perhaps with communication with Silk, it might work out for any one of you in the Middle East. Yes. Professor Omar, are you able to talk now? You raise yes, your hand. Yes, I can. I can talk now. I can talk now. Thank you very much for a great lecture, Professor Abrahma, that answered a lot of the questions that we were mangled with over the last few years. It's really admirable work. My question is, I am practicing vascular surgeon in Egypt, and probably I do vascular stenting equal to carotid entartrectomy. How can you compare two techniques where one of them have reached the golden standard, while the other you have something new every month? We have tapered stents, we have low profile, we have proximal protection devices, we have uh, penumbra devices, we have a stent with distal meshing, how you can standardize and if you think of 20 years time what do you think the future will hold for us as vascular surgeons and thank you very much for your answer yeah. you're welcome let me ask I me mean, you're when you say you are doing stenting you talk about the transfemoral percutaneous or the tika okay the i admire and the trans brachial as well that that's perfect i admire and i'm glad they are allowing you to do that because that's where you keep our specialty in that also was discussed in the implementation guidelines. There is no doubt in our mind, there is no justice to compare a CA, which is started in 1952, you talk about 70 plus years, and a stenting, the first stenting is in the early 1990s. There is, was a PTA in the 80s, but the actual stenting did not start till early 90s. And as you know, it was used to be done by select a group of people. And in the United States, it's still select a group of people. But when they, they became done by everybody, unfortunately, the data was not encouraging. But there's no doubt in our mind, as you suggested, with excessive experience and more modern technology of stenting, it needs to be revisited. The data might be totally different. Absolutely. So at this stage, if you look to our implementation guideline, we say to be done by selective people, this thing, in a select centers. If you have this data and you have the data to prove it, we are saying it's absolutely acceptable. Absolutely. It's an excellent comment, Professor. Yeah. Thank you. Professor Masad, any questions on your part? It looks like Professor Masad is still is still muted. Uh, so uh, 
more, some more questions related relate to TCAR. Do you think TCAR is going to be the way to the future? But I think you answered that earlier about what the data is going to show with respect to the VQI initiative and all the thing. But any any further comments and any advice for the TCAR and for the I, young I, vascular I, I, population? Uh, uh, Professor Haboa, I had a feeling within four or five years, the data might be more or less encouraging that the results are almost as equal, if not equal, to CA. But maybe I'm biased. If it's my, I always tell that to my residents and fellows. If it's my neck and my carotid artery, I don't want to leave a stent or any meter there. I'd like to Professor Habula to take that plaque out. And we already said, we have a 70 years of gold standard where it has been so durable. If you look at our randomized trial, if you do carotid and artectum with the patching, perioperative stroke has been around 1%. If you are doing it really in a great way of doing it, with a stroke and death rate of no more than 1% per year over five year data and 1% per year of significant restenosis. Why would I suggest anything else to be done? But to be fair to TCAR, I would not be surprised the data might be recommending they are exactly equivalent or almost equivalent. I'd like to see that, as you know, the longest data we have on TCAR study-wise is only one year data. So hopefully I have a different answer, Professor Jamal, hopefully in the next few years. One last question that is before we we uh, we stop this very interesting uh, session today that we could take it for another hour at least if we want. Uh, has to do with the combined carotid and coronary artery disease. You have a patient who comes in with severe coronary artery disease, like, like a uh, acute, uh, acute event, ST elevation, positive troponin, lesion in his LAD, and at the same time, they got a carotid duplex, or he is known to have some carotid disease. He has 90% stenosis on one side, 99% stenosis on the other, and he's had a previous stroke about six months ago. And this is a this is an actual case that we discussed in one of our uh, WhatsApp groups, and it was also presented here as a question. So this was a patient who was going to be offered a cabbage for his significant coronary artery disease. And then when they saw that he had the severe bilateral carotid disease, one of them was symptomatic from six months ago, they said, oh, we're not gonna offer cabbage. Let us consider carotid stenting. But knowing that the patient is having angina as we're speaking and he has acute troponins, the question was, what should we do? Should we offer this patient a combined, the combined uh, cabbage carotid disease, open up the chest, open up the carotid, we make sure, or should you go with the carotid stenting? And if you're doing carotid stenting and he crashes on you, what are your explanations and how would you address this? A very, very difficult challenging question, but we certainly appreciate your your uh, your comments as an expert on this topic. I, I actually personally, in this scenario, because of unstable angina, I would do carotid stenting, at least for the side, which is the most impacted in that neck. Six month symptom is still, after beyond three, six months, must be treated more or less as asymptomatic lesion. I would work on the very tight lesion. And because you are stenting and you are giving double antiplatelet, then I'm not sure I would do cabbage. I would go with, um, if you, if you are worried about the bleeding, I would personally, is it stentable for coronaries? If not, you might have no choice except to get a cabbage because you are doing it almost in the same day or within 24 hours. So I'm not sure I would combine endartrectomy with a cabbage unless you tell me in your institutions they have preoperative stroke and death rate of very acceptable way. If it is, I think that's also acceptable. And if you notice in our guidelines, in one of the slides, I said, if it's very tight bilateral lesion, either you combine it with cabbage, but quite many people tell you, no, 
I would not combine it because of higher stroke rate and or death. Let's do a carotid stent and then within a few hours, or even they could be ready to go to the open heart for open heart surgery. That is, but I don't think anyone will criticize you in either way, uh, Professor Jamal. Well, uh, I think uh, we have uh, made use of all the questions that we could ask you for now. Uh, we are so delighted. I would like to make sure any of my co-panelists here, the my dear colleagues and co-founders of the Pan-Arab Vascular Surgical Society, any questions you might have, if you have any questions. So with that, I would like to again tell the audience we are delighted that we had Professor Ali Abu Rahma as our first inaugural lecturer. You could tell why we have chosen him to be the first inaugural lecturer for his passion and his devotion to vascular surgery and for his pride in being a, uh, an Arab American. At the same time, I would like to remind you that we hope to have these educational activities once a month and we welcome you all to be with us in Luxor in our first annual meeting in November 2022. Once again, great thanks to you, Professor Abu Rahma. You have always been a most enjoyable and most dynamic and uh, it's a great pleasure seeing you. And I certainly hope we can host you in our uh, in our meetings, in our first annual meeting and other meetings to come. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Adir Thank you, Dr. Abraham. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Jamia. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.